Hello, everyone. I'll try to make this quick so we can actually go to lunch, because um, we're running a bit late. So, as he said before, uh, my name is Lily. I'm a software engineer at Red Hat, and I've been working in and around Kubernetes for about three years now. Um, the main aim of this talk is to, at the end, you have knowledge to learn about how to use operators and Kubernetes. So if we do want to learn about operators, we need to first learn about Kubernetes itself. So how many of you have heard about Kubernetes before? Very good. Um, and I heard a lot at this conference already that a lot of people already are switching to Kubernetes or have already switched. So and that's really good news. So what is Kubernetes, for those of you that don't know? It's a fully open source container-centric management platform. And it takes care of orchestrating the computing, the networking, the storage of your infrastructures and the user's network. It's automated container deployment, scaling, and management. It basically takes care of all your workloads. It was open sourced by Google in 2014. Um, and it's loosely based on Borg, the internal Google's project. So what is great about Kubernetes and why everyone loves it is that the scalability and separation of users' workloads, that's the main thing. There is also, besides that, people love the rich native stable resources, such as deployment, pods, etc., And of course, the ability to extend the Kubernetes native API, which will be the focus of this talk. So what is Kubernetes not? Uh, Kubernetes tries not to be opinionated. So you can choose whatever language underneath. If it's in a container, Kubernetes doesn't really care. Um, it's not opinionated on your CI, CD choice, on your deployment choices, logging, monitoring, alerting, et cetera. Um, and if we want to learn about Kubernetes, first we have to start with the smallest component, and that is a pod. Um, so the pod, as we said, is the smallest deployable unit, and it's a grouping of the containers where the user's application runs. Uh, the name comes from a group of whales, and that means a pod, and that comes from Docker, because originally Docker was the only container runtime. So um, now that we know where, what a pod is, we'll have a look at a quick overview of Kubernetes. The main component of Kubernetes is the Kube API server, and that lives on the master node. And as we mentioned, the pods all live on the worker nodes. And we can have multiple worker nodes. So the Kube API server, um, which lives on the master node, it exposes the Kubernetes API, and it basically serves as a front end to the cluster. Next up, we have etcd, which can or can't live on the worker node. It, oh, sorry, master node. It depends. It's a consistent and a highly available key data store. And it's basically where all the Kubernetes cluster data resides. So the information about the pods, the number of resources, everything lives in the etcd. And that can be multiple, usually, etcds to have it highly available. Then next up, we have the cube scheduler, which also lives on the master node. And as the name implies, it's a scheduler component of Kubernetes. And basically, it creates the pods that do not have a node assigned to it and selects the node and the information it gets about the pod, it gets from the Kube API server. And on the worker nodes, which we can see at the very end, we have kubelet, and that's the main component. And that's an agent that runs on each of the worker nodes. And basically what it does is it makes sure that the pods and the containers are actually running. With that, we also have the Kube proxy. And that performs network forwarding and basically connects your containers to the outside world. And in the end, we have the container runtime. As we mentioned before, most of you probably know Docker. And, um, but right now, you can choose any container runtime interface you want, as long as it supports the CRI. So things like Rocklet, Cryo, you can choose whatever you want, and Containerd, of course. So now that we've seen a bit about this, let's see. A short demo on how a deployment would work. Oh, sorry. 
So this is pre-recorded as I didn't want any problems with my demos. So we have a um, manifest file. And basically, this is just the YAML manifest file of a deployment. We have the name is the Nginx deployment. We have three replicas. And it's deployed in the namespace J on the beach. And basically, we first have to create the namespace, and then we can actually apply the deployment. And as we can see, the deployment, when it's being deployed, we can actually have a look and see if we do a get all using the kubectl, which is the CLI tool to connect to the Kubernetes cluster, we see that there is nothing. But as soon as we pass the namespace that we provided, we can see the running deployments, are, the pods are being created. So once all the pods are running, it should be in a second, and this was recorded using uh, the Minikube cluster local one. So it can take faster as well. Um, so once we get the pods, um, the W at the end just mean watch, and you can basically um, keep watching the resources you provide. Once we have all three pods running, it means that we created successfully a deployment, and our deployment created the pods. But underneath there, what actually happened was that um, the deployment created a replica set, which in turn created the pods itself. And we can see that by looking at the events. We can see the replica set the first the deployment, then the replica sets, and then the pods were created. So now that we saw a quick overview of what Kubernetes is, um, let's have a look at another important component before we can actually learn what an operator is, and that is Kubernetes controllers. So a second ago, we saw the deployment, and as we said, there is multiple steps before a deployment, what, before a pod is created. Um, and what actually intercepts that is the deployment controller. And that basically reconciles any given steps. And for a deployment controller, those all live in Kubernetes upstream. So they're called the upstream controllers. Um, they basically reconcile to a given state. In that case, it was we wanted three pods to be created. So that's what the controller did for us. It basically uses a pattern uh, known as a level trigger pattern, which uh, the type of architecture is usually known and seen in robotics. And basically, there is some state, and we just want to get into a wanted desired state. And that's all. Um, so now that we understand what a controller is, we want to first see what custom resources are, because they're being heavily used by operators. So, a uh, custom resource is a custom resource definition allows you to define your custom resources within the Kubernetes. When you define your CID and create it, Kubernetes creates a new custom resource for you and with the name and the schema that you provided. And we'll have a look at the manifest files and how they look like a bit later. And basically, Kubernetes API takes that and serves and handles your custom resource for you. So it's basically you do not need to write your own API server. Kubernetes handles that for you. And that basically provides you the flexibility to not need to do anything. It's just simple as doing kubectl create, as we saw earlier. And this is how just the sample manifest looks like of a custom resource definition. And we'll go more into depth of this later. So finally, we can be ready to look at what operators are. And Operators is a huge buzzword these days, especially in the cloud-native world and the Kubernetes world. So let's break down what an operator actually is. So an operator is a Kubernetes controller specific to operate in an application. And what that means is basically it encapsulates the business logic, so it's not an upstream controller. And, and every operator is a controller, but not every controller is an operator. And what that means is that upstream controllers cannot be operators because they do not have the business logic of an application, whereas every operator has a controller component. That's why, it can, that is why always it is a controller. So what is an operator? So the term was coined by CoreOS a couple of years ago, and it makes use of the custom resource definition and the custom resources that we saw a bit earlier, and it basically encapsulates the knowledge that is built in software and code. It basically has a reconcile loop always like any other controller, and, but it is always specific to an application. 
And these are a couple of examples to make it more to make more sense. So as I mentioned, Chorus was the first one to start uh, with operators, and that's why they're they have the longest running operators. So there is the Prometheus operator and the etcd operator to name just two. And basically the the Talando was one of the first ones after CoreOS, and they have the Postgres operator, which they run in production as well. There's also the Jaeger operator, and, and on that list at the very end, there's a list of a lot of operators that you can have a look at and explore. So as we said, operators are always about your application. So like Prometheus, Jaeger, etcd, etc., and so on. But I often get asked, when to choose to create an operator and when I shouldn't choose to create an operator. So whenever you want to actually encapsulate your business logic and have top-level support via kubectl so that everything is natively registered, you should go about and create an operator. And especially if you want to build watches, which we'll have a look a bit later, so that watches that watch the Kubernetes native object and react to it and reconcile, you should be creating an operator. And sometimes you shouldn't, and you should just use a config map or a secret. So for example, if you have a very simple application that you want to deploy, you can create a pod, and then just via a config map or a secret, just pass in any configuration that you want to it. And the config map and secret are resources in Kubernetes itself. And especially if you do not need to reconcile anything, and it's just a one-time living program. So, as I mentioned before, Kubernetes is not opinionated at all on many things. Um, so that's why there's always 101 ways of doing things. And there's 101 ways of building an operator as well. And we'll have a look at three main ones today. We'll have a look at the client Go, the operator SDK, and the cube builder. Um, there's also um, other languages that you can use to communicate to the Kubernetes API. There's the Java client, the Kubernetes Python clients, JavaScript, et cetera. And they're main of, most of them are under the Kubernetes org, so you can just have a look at that. There is also other tooling like Helm and Ansible, and we'll have a look at that in a second as well. So, but first, let's have a look at how you could build Kubernetes using the native clients. So client Go is the uh, component in Kubernetes that Kubernetes also uses to communicate with the API and the cluster. Um, there's different libraries, like the API and API machinery, which you would encounter if you were to create and uh, connect to the Kubernetes API. But those are just libraries that contain things like encoding, packages, schemas, etc. But the main one is client Go, which provides the connection to the API. So there are some pros and cons of using client Go purely or the native clients in general. So if you want to use them to build your operator, you, there are some pros like you can use the same as the upstream controllers use, as I mentioned before. So your code will be hardened. It will be well tested. You can have a look at the examples that the other controllers use. And you can just have a look and explore what they actually do. It also gives you versioning based on the Kubernetes releases. Unlike the other tools, um, the client Go is released like one or two days after a Kubernetes release, meaning that you can always be up to date with the releases, which happen every three months or so. And you have the ability to fine tune. So you can fine tune everything. You can filter the watches using labels, etc., and you can actually get the granularity you want. One of the major downsides is that it's a very large ecosystem. Uh, there's no abstractions, no helpers if you go about using just client Go. And there's a lot of inside knowledge if you actually want to fine tune. So if you're familiar with that already, then you should be. Um, and you probably shouldn't be here anyways. But we'll one. Um, so the, there's a new major in every Kubernetes minor release, and that is, includes a lot of breaking changes that you need to account for, whereas the tools that I'll mention later help you with that. So they help you either migrate or give you migration docs, whereas here you need to figure everything out yourself. So I did a talk about this, about client Go itself a couple of years ago at KubeCon. It was called The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, for obvious reasons. And um, if you want to have a look at that, this is a link at 
it's on the slides. Um, so my mother is not the only one who watches that. Um, but back to client Go in the libraries. So this is a, like an overview of what your controller or your operator would actually interact with. But we'll focus on basically the two main components. And that is the informer and the work queue. So the informer, what it does is, it's a basically an informer pattern. And what it does is it watches for the changes in the current state of the Kubernetes objects and sends the events into the work queue. And the informer pattern basically mirrors the state of the Kubernetes API by placing a list watch into the API. And it does this to list all the resources you get. And you get a version of that list, and then you place a watch of that version into the API. And that means that Kubernetes sends us all the events since the start of that list. The resource event handler function basically has the three trigger functions, the add, update, and delete. And basically, you get these events, and then you react and reconcile based on those events. So if on delete, you want to clean up everything, on add, update, you might want to do different things. And as I mentioned, the things go, the keys all go into a work queue. So the resource event handler puts an item into the work queue, and it's based on the resource namespace and resource name key. And it works by the first in, first out method. So this is an example of how this, there's a sample controller under the Kubernetes org on GitHub. And this is basically an example of an operator, but it's not an operator until you put your business logic in there. So right now, what it does is just creates a CRD, and it connects to the API. And in the controller file, you would then put all your business logic. For example, of the Prometheus operator creates a stateful set to create the Prometheus and then reconcile based on that. So you would do that. You can just git clone this and play around. The, there are two tools, and we'll focus on those two mainly. The first one being Cube Builder. And basically, Cube Builder is a part of the Kubernetes six organization, so it's part of the Kubernetes org. And it's an SDK for building the Kubernetes APIs using CRDs. And what it does is it uses controller runtime, which is another tool that the next tool also uses. And that's just a collection of libraries and schemas to help you connect and help you handle your controllers. And its aim is to maybe one day um, replace the upstream controllers or build new controllers as well. It doesn't strictly advertise itself as an operator building tool. Um, it's more aimed at creating controllers itself. And it's written in Go um, only, and there is no other language selection, because the Kubernetes itself is written in Go, and all the client Go and everything components are written in Go as well. So this is how you would go about generating a Go operator using Cube Builder. So you would create a directory, you would CD into that, and then you would do an init, uh, the, the name main, et cetera, and then you would create an API. And that would generate a bunch of files for you, and the only file you would need to technically edit is the controller file. And that is where all your logic would live. And it's ready to then, there, it has a Docker file, and it's ready to actually be deployed in your Kubernetes cluster. Um, and next up is Operator SDK, and a small disclaimer, I work on Operator SDK as part of Red Hat, so I might be a bit biased, but I'm hopefully not too much. Um, and Operator SDK's project is under the Operator framework. It was started with CoreOS already, um, before Red Hat um, acquired it. And it basically contains high-level abstractions and helpers to create operators specifically. It can create a Go, Helm, or an Ansible operator. It has a CLI tool that we'll have a look at later. But unlike Cube Builder, it has different components, like the testing end-to-end -end testing framework, the metrics by default, and it has the build and the local run commands that help you a lot when you want to either debug or run things locally. And this is an example in the same way as we saw with Kubler. This is how you would go about creating a Go operator. And we'll go into more into the depth, depth not later when we have the demo. Uh, as I mentioned, there's two other types. So there's the Helm, 
And basically with Helm, you would just do operator as the K new, and you can even pass the Helm charts flag and pass your already existing Helm charts to be converted into an operator. There is also the Ansible one, which you also then edit all your logic in the watches file. And there is really good documentation in our repo, but also on the interactive playground where you can go about and create your operators either through Helm, Ansible, or Go. And um, it's, there is a cluster, I think it's an OpenShift cluster, which is the Kubernetes Red Hat offering. And you can just play around with that on the website. But first, let's have a look at how, as I mentioned before, there is 101 ways of building an operator. So there is 101 ways of deploying an operator as well, as Kubernetes is not biased or doesn't really care what's happening there. So the, I'll just show the main ways, but there's a lot of them, and the list would go on. So YAML, like we saw earlier with the deployments file, there is customized, JSONnet, OLM, Helm, and et cetera. But we'll mainly focus on YAML and OLM in this talk. So with YAML and manifests that we saw earlier, you would just, through the kubectl command line tool, you would just first, if you want to deploy your operator, you would first register your CRD with the Kubernetes API. Then you would apply any role-based access control. So this is for whenever your operator wants to access um, the list of pods or the list of deployments, you would then add any of those roles to the file, and you would basically create that first. Then you would apply and create your deployment in a similar way that we saw earlier, and then you would create an instance of that operator. So basically, that is the custom resource. And let's have a look at these files. Don't get scared by the size of this file. This is nothing you actually need to worry about. This is something, if you're the developer of an operator, you just need to write once. And basically, these are just the names, the long names, the short names, the singular names, so that Kubernetes actually knows what the operator is. And it can display this to the user when they try to do kubectl get your operator name. So this is what you would first create before you actually deploy your operator so that Kubernetes actually knows what it is. Then, as we saw earlier, in a similar way, this is a deployment manifest file. So in this case, it's just a memcached operator that we have in our um, operator SDK samples. And it basically still has the image, the replicas, and just the names. And this is how the custom resource, so an instance of that operator would look like. So basically, in this case, we want to create an instance of an operator called example memcached, and we want to have size 3, which in this case gets intercepted by the operator and does based on that size something that we want to do. So as I mentioned earlier, besides manifest, there's a bunch of ways of doing things, of how to deploy operator and how to manage. Um, any deployment, basically. Um, one of them is OLM, and that's the Operator Lifecycle Manager. Um, this was developed as part of the Operator Framework, and it's basically a, a catalog of your applications. But in this case, the applications are operators under the hood. And basically, they, some nice features that are missing by default in Kubernetes, such as upgrades, some descriptions, and there's a UI as well. And you can deploy this in any Kubernetes cluster. By default, it's an OpenShift 4.1 onwards. But you can take that. It's all open sourced, and you can deploy it. There is also multiple versions of operators, and there is also um, a way to upgrade your operator from one version to another. There is a, um, a list of, if you go on the operating lifecycle or operator framework, GitHub repo, there is a list of already existing operators that were converted to the OLM way. So there is a bunch of manifest files, and you can have a look and use those already. So like the Prometheus operator that we saw earlier, the etcd operator, etc., they're all already converted to use the operator lifecycle manager. So if we want to have a look at the a short demo of how to actually create an operator. So um, this is, I'm using operators SDK mainly because I, can everyone see this? Yeah. Um, mainly because I know it quite well, so that's why I did that. So basically what we did was we created a, 
we started an operator using operator as the k new, and then we passed j on the beach. Um, and then the next step is it creates a bunch of files for us, and we'll have a look at those later. And then we add an API. So we add the type of, of the kind of the API and the, the group and the version of it. And that, again, generates some files for us. And we don't really need to care right now which ones it does. It does everything. So it's basically a way to connect to the API. And it creates the controllers and the APIs, and it registers. And it generates a bunch of code as well. And when that is generated, the next step after that is to add the controller. So we basically we add a controller with the same kind and type and name so that we have the APIs files and the controller files. And then everything that we want to edit will be in that controller file, so under the package controller. So sorry, this is the Go way. But it, if everyone uses here Java, I'm sure migration to Go will be quite easy. So when we actually vendor, so this is the Go mod, the latest dependency manager. So when we actually vendor the code, after that, we can use the build command. So the operator SDK has the build command. So basically, it just builds your Go code and then produces a Docker image that it sends to your local Docker registry. And basically, it does everything for you, and it produces that. The Docker file is already in the repo that you created, and it's generated for you. And after that, we just take that image name, and in the operator ma manifest file, the deployment one, we just um, switch the image. And this is because I didn't feel like pushing my image so, um, in an image registry, so I just did it locally. And then we follow the steps that we mentioned earlier. So we create a custom resource definition in the API. The next step, we create all the rollback access, access control, which is also generated for you, but you can tweak that if you, when you actually tweak the controllers, when you know what kind of resources you actually want to create. So the role binding, the roles, and the service account is then created. And after that, we can actually deploy our operator. So once that is deployed, we can actually have a look at the operator. So it's already running. And it also created a service which exposes Prometheus metrics by default. And if we have a look at the operator logs, it says that it started, but it's not doing anything yet. That is because we haven't created an instance of it. So when we create an instance of the custom resource, which we saw earlier, when that is created, we can have a look at the logs again. And you can see that it started reconciling. And basically, what it did was, by default, it creates a pod so you can actually test things out. And then you replace all your business logic there. There are some to-dos for the user. And you can see the um, pod was created by the operator itself. So the next step is when you have a deployed operator and you, when you put your logic in there and you actually have things running, things are not running sometimes. And a lot of people ask me, what are some ways to actually debug an operator? If you're using um, operator SDK, there's the operator SDK up local, which basically outputs all the logs on the terminal. And you can run your operator there. Then what I would suggest is log everything. Log and just pass the debug flags and just log all the things. Um, label, make sure to label your pod where your operator is running, or even the deployment itself, so that you can do kubectl logs and then pass the label name. And log, uh, label also your custom resource that are being created by your operator. And that will make it easier for you to debug things, that you can get things easier, you can list things easier, and see what's not running very fast. But if your pod is not even started, you can then do kubectl events like we did earlier. So you pass the namespace if you have a deployment in the namespace, which probably you should. And you can see the events. And you can easily see if your operator and why it's not running. So for example, it's often the case that the image pull was not successful, or there are some, uh, there are some RBAC stuff that you're missing. And you can see that easily through the kubectl events. And the other cool thing is 
in every resource in Kubernetes, there is a spec.paused field that is by default set to false. But if you set it to true, what it means, so when you do kubectl edit, let's say a deployment, um, you then can add that field, and that pauses your deployment. It, and your operator will stop creating things for you. And you can debug in between what's happening so that your operator doesn't keep reconciling things, but you can just pause things and actually debug easier. So now that we saw a bit about operators and everything, let's have a look at the um, state of current um, for big data in Kubernetes. Um, there, uh, Kubernetes has user groups and SIGs, so the special interest groups, and one of them is for big data as well. It has, a regular business, it has regular group meetings that anyone can join. It's, it, it's either recorded if you don't want to join, but you can join and not say anything or say things. There's also the Slack channel. So this is on the Kubernetes Slack channel. It's the um, user group big data Slack channel. And you can join there and ask questions. So the other thing is there is this um, the repo. So every Kubernetes special interest group or user group has the has a field under has a um, has a document under the user community user group big data and basically it gives you the current state and you can browse that later there is a link at the end the main the most prominent thing that is being worked on is the spark operator and that's being worked on by google and you can join and look at what's happening with that um, other things are Lyft is working on an Apache Flink operator. And if you just join the user group, you can ask around and maybe help out with the knowledge that you learned today or build your new operators as well. So then hopefully you learned a bit about operators and you might start building new operators around big data as well. Thank you. OK, there are no questions in the, in the document, but I have one my, myself. Go for it. Uh, you, you were talking about debugging using logs, yes. but is there any other way, like attaching a debugger to your operator yes. or, or something like that? Um, there is a way if you use IDEA. Um, so if you use that, there is a blog post. So if you just Google, someone is using operator SDK in, um, with that ID and you can actually debug things. And they have a step-by-step -step blog post on how to do it. So if you just Google that and operator SDK, it should give you the link to that. OK, so okay. next thanks again, Thank Lily, for his talk. Yeah, and if you have any questions about Kubernetes or operators, you can just ask later as well. Thank you.